Uh, I'm Dave with VBOX, uh, and I want to uh, talk to you a little bit today about uh, a little bit about who we are, what we do, uh, and some of our customers and how they're using us and what they're what they're getting out of the partnership with VBOX. Um, we're now part of the Unity family, so we were acquired by Unity almost two months ago, two months into our new relationship, and uh, very very excited about sort of what's coming down the pipe there. Um, so who is VBOX? So we do, and what do we do? We do voice chat. We do voice chat and games. We've been doing it for a very long time. We've been doing it since 2005 with some of the biggest names in gaming. So working with some of the biggest publishers and the biggest developers to make their games more social, to embed voice chat into the, the game experience. Um, because we've been doing it for so long, we've got by far the most experience in doing this. We've got an experienced team. Uh, we've got a really, really mature platform that we continue to build on top of and continue to extend. Um, and it's just, it's been proven uh, over and over and over again. Uh, when we work with a partner, we deliver this as a hosted managed service. So they take our SDK, they integrate it into the game, uh, and then uh, we take care of everything else. We take care of the servers and the cloud infrastructure and everything behind the scenes. So here's some of our partners and some of the, the folks that we work with. Um, so we've been working with Blizzard for quite some time now. We were part of the Overwatch launch, part of World of Warcraft, Heroes of the Storm. Really everything that Blizzard does now uh, is, uh, is leveraging our tech. Uh, we're part of uh, the PUBG uh, launch uh, and uh, part of PUBG over the last couple of years. We're part of Fortnite. Uh, we work, again, with some of the biggest names in gaming. Um, we also work with lots and lots of smaller companies as well. So we've got several hundred indies that we work with uh, that don't quite make the slide. Uh, but they're all able to take advantage of the same tech, the same core features on all the same platforms. Uh, and we continue to, to, uh, to extend that list. So why do people care about this? Why is it important? Right? It's important because the more social you can make your game, the more engaging your game will be. Right? If people get into your game and they get connected with other people and they form friendships and relationships there, or they start talking to somebody about how to do something and they learn to play your game faster, they're gonna stay with your game longer. And as I mentioned, we host and manage servers behind the scenes for all of those partners. So we can see in the data the impact that that actually has. And what we see is if someone comes into a game and they don't engage and they don't start communicating with the people around them, they're likely to turn out of the game very quickly. If they come in and they make a connection and they start a conversation or they become part of a social group in the game, then they stay with the game, and their engagement is much, much higher. Uh, the overall lifetime value of that user is much, much higher. Uh, you want people to get connected to the community and to become a part of the game. So we see this in the data. We see this in the data regardless of the game type, whether it's a MOBA or a shooter or an MMO or whatever. Uh, we see it regardless of platforms. So if you're a mobile game or you're a console game or you're a PC game, we see the same patterns, like social is important. Getting people connected is important. Talk a little bit more about what it actually is. So it's integrated chat, right? So it's an SDK that integrates into and becomes part of the game experience. Uh, so if you're playing Overwatch and you join a team, you'll get voice chat for your team. You'll see a little speaker icon light up when your teammates talk. You don't deal with VBOX separately, we're part of the game experience and we just become embedded in there. Uh, we do that for uh, well over 100 million users a month uh, across uh, all of those titles. Um, as I mentioned, hosted managed service, which means it's really, really simple for a developer to come start working with us, take our SDK, integrate it into the game client, and be done. And then it doesn't really matter if that game comes out and supports 100 users or supports 100 million users. Like it's, the technology's just gonna be there and just gonna work. A little bit more on the SDKs. So we've got several flavors of our SDKs. Uh, first is sort of the core libraries. The core libraries have been integrated into essentially every game engine uh, over the last 15 years that's existed. So we work with a lot of in-house engines. Uh, we've worked with Unreal, we've worked with Unity, uh, and we continue to do so. Um, we also have plugins for Unity and plugins for Unreal. Um, and those are essentially wrappers around the, the core SDK. Uh, but they make it a little bit easier if you're a Unity dev or if you're an Unreal dev to work with, with content that you're, you're familiar with. On the Unreal side, you know, we're, we're really excited about the relationship that we have with Epic. 
uh, and it's a multi-year relationship. We've been friends for a very long time. Um, our, our Unreal plugin is actually going to ship with the Unreal Engine next week. So if you're an Unreal developer, uh, you're automatically going to have access to our technology when you update your engine next week. A little bit on the developer experience and what a developer does when they come in. Um, so the first touch point with a developer is, is really come into a developer portal. And that'll be like your, your uh, viewpoint into VBox, really, in a lot of ways. So a developer comes into our developer portal. They get access to the SDKs. It might be the, one of the plugins or the core libraries for whatever platforms that they need. Um, they can uh, get access to back-end systems. So we deliver keys uh, via that thing. They can get access to developer support and help and documentation. They can see in the dashboard how many users are actually connected into the service and using the service now. Um, this really becomes the one-stop shop for, for everything, uh, everything VBOX. On the back end, uh, we're supporting servers in a lot of different ways in a lot of different locations. So we have a lot of servers in our data center in Boston. Um, we've got a lot of points of presence with AWS and other cloud services. We have uh, services that are hosted by our customers in their data centers. Um, and so we end up with really, really broad coverage from a geo perspective and able to put servers really anywhere around the world. Um, one of the examples of, of some of the flexibility and kind of the things we do, a uh, few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, Epic had an event in Fortnite uh, with Marshmallow. Uh, and it was an awesome, amazing social experience. If you haven't seen the videos, go check it out. It was very, very, very cool. Um, but from our perspective, you know, what we got was a call that said, hey, we're gonna have an event in a couple of weeks. We're gonna need to double capacity. So Fortnite's a pretty big game. Doubling capacity for us means lots and lots and lots of servers, so several hundred servers. Uh, we don't really wanna buy those servers for a weekend, so we burst into AWS for the weekend. We support the event. I think they said somewhere well north of 10 million players, uh, connect concurrent players during the event. Um, use that capacity in AWS and then drain that down afterwards. Um, the reason we do that is it's much, much cheaper to run systems on bare metal than it is in AWS, but you lose all the flexibility that you get out of that. A little bit on the feature set and what kinds of features get exposed into the games. Um, mentioned Overwatch earlier, so if you're in Overwatch, you've got team chat that's, uh, that's just part of the game experience. Um, if you're in another game, you might use us for 3D positional voice. And what that means is uh, you hear other players relative to where they're positioned in world. So I can walk up to someone and talk to them in a game that's supporting this. I walk away, I fade off into the distance. I hear people relative to where they are in the game. And maybe one of the best examples of that are our friends over at PUBG. Uh, so PUBG really is the game that launched the Battle Royale craze in a lot of ways. Uh, PUBG uses us for a few different things. Um, when you join a match, you join a match with 99 other people, Battle Royale, um, you get 3D positional voice. So when you drop into the map, you can talk to anybody around you. You can walk up and talk to them just like you can in the real world. And what that does is it creates this really unique sort of social layer over the game. It's very different playing uh, PUBG than some of the other Battle Royale, Royale games because you can walk up to somebody and tell them a joke or beg for your life or they can overhear you talking to your friends and then use that to sneak up on you. It adds a completely different layer to the, uh, uh, to the social experience. Uh, PUBG also uses us for squad chat, so if you don't want to be overheard, you can just talk to your squad. So you've got 3D chat and squad chat uh, and uh, we're able to mix and match and do all of that uh, for really as many conversations as you want to you want to handle. Um, PUBG is another interesting example from a scale perspective because uh, when they came out, they were expecting they had fairly modest expectations for um, for the success of that game. Um, and then they came out, and within a few months, they were the biggest game on Steam. And within a few months after that, they peaked at something like three million concurrent players. So just north of three million concurrent players playing PUBG from around the world. Um, to give you an idea of what it takes to do that on the 3D positional chat for three million concurrent players. So we've got three million players connected in little groups of 100. So each match is 100 players. Each of those players under the covers, they've connected into an audio channel. They're updating their position, something like 10 times a second. They tell VBOX 
here's where I am, here's my XYZ position, here's my orientation. That info comes up to our server and our server decides, hey, player A can hear player B or player B is too far out, so he shouldn't get this audio mix. What it really means though is that 50 times a second, we're creating an absolutely unique audio mix for every player that's connected to the service. So three million players connected to the service, 50 calculations a second so that each one of those players gets their own unique audio mix based on where they are and where other people are. Uh, it ends up being fairly complex on the back end. Uh, and it's, from a developer perspective, don't worry about that. Like, it's just gonna work, and it's just gonna work at scale. But when you really break it down and you start looking at what's behind the scenes on some of this stuff, it, it's, it's more complicated than you might realize. Client platforms. So we talked about the libraries, the SDKs a little bit earlier. Um, so we've got SDKs for consoles, for PlayStation, for Xbox, for Nintendo Switch, uh, PC, we do Windows and Mac, iOS, Android for mobile devices. There's a web-only version of the SDK. Um, and kind of in the, the same spirit of, of Unity as you know, develop once, deploy everywhere, um, you're developing, our developers are using the same APIs, they're getting the same functionality regardless of which platform they're going to. So you don't have to go and develop against PlayStation Voice and against Xbox Voice and do something else with Steam. You do one set of APIs, one set of libraries that work everywhere. By the way, it gives you the best user experience on all of those platforms. So you get a best in class user experience, you get less effort from the developer, and you end up with a better player experience, which is really what you're trying to do. The other thing that we can do with this is enable crossplay. So all of our platforms can communicate, all of them can interoperate. From our perspective, you can put a PlayStation user together with an iOS user, together with an Xbox user. It doesn't matter. We're just moving audio to the various client platforms. Probably the most interesting example of that is, again, Fortnite and our friends at Fortnite. So one of the things that's unique about Fortnite, that's really, really cool about Fortnite, is as this game is building and the community is building, they did not want to separate and segregate their community into a PlayStation bucket, into an Xbox bucket, into an iOS bucket. Like, that's not how I think of my friends, right? I think of a friend that I want to play with. They want to enable that in Fortnite regardless of the platform you're on. So they've enabled and they've been kind of at the forefront with crossplay in a lot of ways. Uh, but in Fortnite, you can play with anybody on your friends list. You don't really need to know that your friend's on an Xbox or your friend is on an iPhone or your friend is on a Switch. Right? And that's the goal. It's one community. It's one seamless community rather than having, again, things separated out by platform. Um, we're a little bit unique because we're the only solution that touches all of these platforms that can enable this. So we're very, very happy to support our friends at Fortnite. We love what they've done with Crossplay. We think it is a great thing for the developer. We think it's a great thing for the player. And we think it's not such a bad thing for the platform providers as well. So we're excited to see where that goes, goes in the future. Consoles. So PlayStation has chat, Xbox has chat, so why, why would people want to talk to us on either of those platforms? And it's really, for some games, we may not be the right solution. Right? If you want something really, really basic and absolutely free, we may not be the right fit. Um, but there's a series of checkboxes that sometimes we, match, we map into. Um, first, it's generally a better, we're going to deliver a better user experience. Your player experience is going to be better. It's going to be more reliable. Because the way we're set up, we don't have issues with NAT devices and things failing under the covers, as sometimes happens with party chat uh, on the consoles. It's easier for the developer. So our API is at the level of join channel. It's not moving audio packets from player A to player B. Um, everything is server-based, um, and, uh, and that simplifies things for the developer, and again, delivers, helps us deliver a better user experience. Uh, also, things like 3D positional, it's kind of hard to implement if you're using really low, low level APIs. We make it super simple to do things like that. And then finally, if you're developing a game that's gonna be on more than one platform and or you wanna do crossplay, then again, we make that easy, right? Use the same tech, get a consistent user experience, consistent developer experience, and don't keep reinventing the wheel on each of these platforms. Little bit on the back end. We won't spend much time here. The back end works very, very well. So we're massively scalable. We talked about a couple of titles that have had many millions of concurrent users uh, and uh, the fact that the platform just works. We're scalable in other ways. So we've had partners that have put 
almost 10,000 people into a single conversation for one of the events that we did with our friends over at what used was at that time Sony Online. Um, so we're very flexible in terms of what we can deliver. Um, we've got some clever optimizations, so it doesn't really matter if you're in a conversation with two people or 2,000 people, you're gonna have the same uh, footprint, the same CPU footprint, the same network footprint, uh, and it's just gonna work. That becomes important if you're on a mobile network or you're on a mobile device or something that's a little bit more limited. We stay in our little envelope and uh, regardless of, of the number of participants, what's happening around us. Example of somebody that really cared about what we did on the back end of the platform would be Rainbow Six Siege. So Rainbow Six Siege um, had already been in market for well over a year when they started talking to us. Um, the game was very successful and was continuing to grow a year in. And one of the things that Ubisoft wanted to do was to start doing more serious competitive gaming around this, this title. Um, and as they started to look at esports and more serious competitive gaming around Rainbow Six, there were some systems that needed to change. Um, there were a lot of systems under the cover that were doing things, moving traffic directly from player A to player B, sort of peer-to-peer -peer traffic going between, between players. Um, that's not great if you're in a competitive environment. If I'm playing against you and there's $100,000 on the line and I can find your IP address, maybe I send a DDoS. Maybe I don't just send audio packets. Maybe I send a DDoS and a whole flood of packets to take you out of the game, right? So there are systems, and it wasn't just voice chat. They had a whole program, they called it Operation Help, uh, and they swapped out a lot of their underlying peer-to-peer -peer systems for more reliable sort of server-based systems. Um, so we were part of that, part of Operation Help. We came into the, to, uh, Rainbow Six on Windows, on uh, Xbox, and on PlayStation. Um, Ubisoft got everything that they wanted out of that experience. What they didn't expect was the player reaction. So players had been living with sort of System A for the first year, and then all of a sudden the next weekend, System B came in and was much, much, much better. And uh, there was a very, very, very positive reaction from the player base that Ubisoft had actually fixed one of these core functions in the game after being in market for a year. Uh, so awesome, uh, awesome partnership, relationship, and, uh, and again, uh, couldn't be happier to be working with the folks over at Ubisoft. And that's it. So the uh, final message here, and the message for big dev, small dev, it doesn't matter. Like, come use the same tech that the biggest guys in the industry use. Come use it for free. Come get it for free, use our services, make your game successful. Once you're successful, pay us for capacity beyond that. And that's it. Cool. Yeah, any questions, anyone? Maybe not. You have a question. Hi, Hi. Uh, is your 3D positional chat um, more than attenuation based off distance? Like, is it true spatial audio? It's a couple of different things. So the question, uh, actually you're on a mic, so everyone heard the question. Is 3D positional chat more than just attenuation? So uh, it is directional and uh, distance-based volume attenuation. Um, there are uh, some things that are coming into the stack in the next few months, HRTF, head-related transfer functions, um, that will allow that to behave uh, even more realistically. Um, so it, it works It works well now, and you get sort of left, right, positional, and volume attenuation based on distance. Um, if you have the right audio setup in a few months, it's going to be much, much more nuanced and more realistic. Still no? All right. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, where is these, all this uh, voice recording? Uh, can they be archived, stored? Um, it can be. By default, we don't keep a lot of data. We try not to keep data. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but there is an option to, uh, to pull the audio off, to record the audio um, that's being deployed out, deployed with a customers, couple of customers in the next month. Um, and so for that, you could basically say, hey, uh, I heard one of my friends said something I don't think they could have said, I want to record them. Well, what we'll actually enable is, I want to pull the last five minutes of audio for this person. So it's not just push a red button and start the recording. It's a little more complex than that, what we're, the way we're gonna expose it so that as a developer, you've got a lot of flexibility in sort of pulling the audio off and, uh, and using it for, for a variety of reasons. Anybody else? Thank you very much, guys, appreciate it.